The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 4 Manhood, Part 3. 8. The First Journey with the Reindeer. Those were happy days for Claus when he carried his accumulation of toys to the children who had awaited them so long. During his imprisonment in the valley he had been so industrious that all his shelves were filled with playthings, and after quickly supplying the little ones living nearby, he saw he must now extend his travels to wider fields. Remembering the time when he had journeyed with Ock through all the world, he knew children were everywhere, and he longed to make as many as possible happy with his gifts. So he loaded a great sack with all kinds of toys, slung it upon his back that he might carry it more easily, and started off on a longer trip than he had yet undertaken. Wherever he showed his merry face, in hamlet or in farmhouse, he received a cordial welcome, for his fame had spread into far lands. At each village the children swarmed about him, following his footsteps wherever he went, and the women thanked him gratefully for the joy he brought to their little ones, and the men looked upon him curiously that he should devote his time to such a queer occupation as toy-making. But every one smiled on him, and gave him kindly words, and Claus felt amply repaid for his long journey. When the sack was empty, he went back again to the Laughing Valley, and once more filled it to the brim. This time he followed another road, into a different part of the country, and carried happiness to many children who never before had owned a toy, or guessed that such a delightful plaything existed. After a third journey, so far away that Claus was many days walking the distance, the store of toys became exhausted, and without delay he set about making a fresh supply. From seeing so many children, and studying their tastes, he had acquired several new ideas about toys. The dollies were, he had found, the most delightful of all playthings for babies and little girls, and often those who could not say dolly would call for a doll in their sweet baby talk. So Claus resolved to make many dolls, of all sizes, and to dress them in bright-colored clothing. The older boys, and even some of the girls, loved the images of animals, so he still made cats and elephants and horses. And many of the little fellows had musical natures, and longed for drums, and cymbals, and whistles, and horns. So he made a number of toy drums, with tiny sticks to beat them with. And he made whistles from the willow trees, and horns from the bog reeds, and cymbals made from bits of beaten metal. All of this kept him busily at work, and before he realized it the winter season came, with deeper snows than usual, and he knew he could not leave the valley with his heavy pack. Moreover, the next trip would take him farther from home than ever before, and Jack Frost was mischievous enough to nip his nose and ears if he undertook the long journey while the Frost King reigned. The Frost King was Jack's father, and never reproved him for his pranks. So Claus remained at his workbench, but he whistled and sang as merrily as ever, for he would allow no disappointment to sour his temper or make him unhappy. One bright morning he looked from his window and saw two of the deer he had known in the forest walking toward his house. Claus was surprised, not that the friendly deer should visit him, but that they walked on the surface of the snow as easily as if it were solid ground, notwithstanding the fact that throughout the valley the snow lay many feet deep. He had walked out of his house a day or two before, and had sunk to his armpits in a drift. So when the deer came near, he opened the door and called to them, "'Good morning, Flossie. Tell me how you are able to walk on the snow so easily.' "'It's frozen hard,' answered Flossie. "'The Frost King has breathed on it,' said Glossie, coming up. "'And the surface is now as solid as ice.' "'Perhaps.' remarked claus thoughtfully i might now carry my pack of toys to the children is it a long journey asked flossie yes it will take me many days for the pack is heavy answered claus then the snow would melt before you could get back said the deer you must wait until spring claus claus sighed had i your fleet feet said he i could make the journey in a day but you have not returned glossy looking at his own slender legs with pride perhaps i could ride upon your back claus ventured to remark after a pause oh no our backs are not strong enough to bear your weight said flossy decidedly 
but if you had a sledge and could harness us to it we might draw you easily and your pack as well i'll make a sledge exclaimed claus will you agree to draw me if i do well replied flossie we must first go and ask the nooks who are our guardians for permission but if they consent and you can make a sledge and harness we will gladly assist you then go at once cried claus eagerly i am sure the friendly nooks will give me their consent and by the time you are back i shall be ready to harness you to my sledge flossie and glossy being dear of much intelligence had long wished to see the great world so they gladly ran over the frozen snow to ask the nooks if they might carry claus on his journey meanwhile the toy maker hurriedly began the construction of a sledge using material from his woodpile he made two long runners that turned upward at the front ends and across these nailed two short boards to make a platform it was soon completed but was as rude in appearance as it is possible for a sledge to be the harness was more difficult to prepare but claus twisted strong cords together and knotted them so they would fit around the necks of the deer in the shape of a collar from these ran other cords to fasten the deer to the front of the sledge before the work was completed glossy and flossy were back from the forest having been granted permission by will nook to make the journey with claus provided they would to bursey by daybreak the next morning that is not a very long time said flossy but we are swift and strong and if we get started by this evening we can travel many miles during the night claus decided to make the attempt so he hurried on his preparations as fast as possible after a time he fastened the collars around the necks of his steeds and harnessed them to his rude sledge then he placed a stool on the little platform to serve as a seat and filled a sack with his prettiest toys how do you intend to guide us asked glossy we have never been out of the forest before except to visit your house so we shall not know the way claus thought about that for a moment then he brought more cords and fastened two of them to the spreading antlers of each deer one on the right and the other on the left those will be my reins said claus and when i pull them to the right or to the left you must go in that direction if i do not pull the reins at all you may go straight ahead very well answered glossy and flossy and then they asked are, are you ready, ready? claus seated himself upon the stool placed the sack of toys at his feet and then gathered up the reins all ready he shouted away we go the deer leaned forward lifted their slender limbs and the next moment away flew the sledge over the frozen snow the swiftness of the motion surprised claus for in a few strides they were across the valley and gliding over the broad plain beyond the day had melted into evening by the time they started for swiftly as claus had worked many hours had been consumed in making his preparation but the moon shone brightly to light their way and claus soon decided it was just as pleasant to travel by night as by day the deer liked it better for although they wished to see something of the world they were timid about meeting men and now all the dwellers in the towns and farmhouses were sound asleep and could not see them away and away they sped on and on over the hills and through the valleys and across the plains until they reached a village where claus had never been before here he called on them to stop and they immediately obeyed but a new difficulty now presented itself for the people had locked their doors when they went to bed and claus found he could not enter the houses to leave his toys i am afraid my friends we have made our journey for nothing said he for i shall be obliged to carry my playthings back home again without giving them to the children of this village what's the matter asked flossie the doors are locked answered claus and i cannot get in glossie looked around at the houses the snow was quite deep in that village and just before them was a roof only a few feet above the sledge a broad chimney which seemed to glossy big enough to admit claus was at the peak of the roof why don't you climb down that chimney asked glossy claus looked at it that would be easy enough if i were on top of the roof he answered then hold fast and we will take you there said the deer and they gave one bound to the roof and landed beside the big chimney good 
cried claus well pleased and he slung the pack of toys over his shoulder and got into the chimney there was plenty of soot on the bricks but he did not mind that and by placing his hands and knees against the sides he crept downward until he had reached the fireplace leaping lightly over the smoldering coals he found himself in a large sitting-room where a dim light was burning from this room two doorways led into smaller chambers in one a woman lay asleep with a baby beside her in a crib claus laughed but he did not laugh aloud for fear of waking the baby then he slipped a big doll from his pack and laid it in the crib the little one smiled as if it dreamed of the pretty plaything it was to find on the morrow and claus crept softly from the room and entered at the other doorway here were two boys fast asleep with their arms around each other's neck claus gazed at them lovingly a moment and then placed upon the bed a drum two horns and a wooden elephant he did not linger now that his work in this house was done but climbed the chimney again and seated himself on his sledge can you find another chimney he asked the reindeer easily enough replied glossy and flossy down to the edge of the roof they raced and then without pausing leaped through the air to the top of the next building where a huge old-fashioned chimney stood don't be so long this time called flossy or we shall never get back to the forest by daybreak claus made a trip down this chimney also and found five children sleeping in the house all of whom were quickly supplied with toys when he returned the deer sprang to the next roof but on descending the chimney claus found no children there at all that was not often the case in this village however so he lost less time than you might suppose in visiting the dreary homes where there were no little ones when he had climbed down the chimneys of all the houses in that village and had left a toy for every sleeping child claus found that his great sack was not yet half emptied onward friends he called to the deer we must seek another village so away they dashed although it was long past midnight and in a surprisingly short time they came to a large city the largest claus had ever visited since he began to make toys but nothing daunted by the throng of houses he set to work at once and his beautiful steeds carried him rapidly from one roof to another only the highest being beyond the leaps of the agile deer at last the supply of toys was exhausted and claus seated himself in the sledge with the empty sack at his feet and turned the heads of glossy and flossy toward home presently flossy asked what is that gray streak in the sky it is the coming dawn of day answered claus surprised to find it was so late good gracious exclaimed glossy then we shall not be home by daybreak and the nooks will punish us and never let us come again we must race for the laughing valley and make our best speed returned flossy so hold fast friend claus claus held fast and the next moment was flying so swiftly over the snow that he could not see the trees as they whirled past uphill and down dale swift as an arrow shot from a bow they dashed and claus shut his eyes to keep the wind out of them and left the deer to find their own way it seemed to him they were plunging through space but he was not at all afraid the nooks were severe masters and must be obeyed at all hazards and the gray streak in the sky was growing brighter every moment finally the sledge came to a sudden stop and claus who was taken unawares tumbled from his seat into a snowdrift as he picked himself up he heard the deer crying quick, quick friend, friend quick, quick. Cut, cut away our harness. harness he drew his knife and rapidly severed the cords and then he wiped the moisture from his eyes and looked around him the sledge had come to a stop in the laughing valley only a few feet he found from his own door in the east the day was breaking and turning to the edge of burzee he saw glossy and flossy just disappearing in the forest nine santa claus claus thought that none of the children would ever know where the toys came from which they found by their bedsides when they wakened the following morning but kindly deeds are sure to bring fame and fame has many wings to carry its tidings into far lands so for miles and miles in every direction people were talking of claus and his wonderful gifts to children the sweet generousness of his work called a few selfish folk to sneer but even these were forced to admit their respect for a man so gentle-natured that he loved to devote his life to pleasing the helpless little ones of his race therefore the inhabitants of every city and village had been eagerly watching the coming of claus and remarkable stories of his beautiful playthings were told the children to keep them patient and contented 
when on the morning following the first trip of claus with his deer the little ones came running to their parents with the pretty toys they had found and asked from whence they came there was but one reply to the question the good claus must have been here my darlings for his are the only toys in all the world but how did he get in asked the children at this the fathers shook their heads being themselves unable to understand how claus had gained admittance to their homes but the mothers watching the glad faces of their dear ones whispered that the good claus was no mortal man but assuredly a saint and they piously blessed his name for the happiness he had bestowed upon their children a saint said one with a bowed head has no need to unlock doors if it pleases him to enter our homes and afterward when a child was naughty or disobedient its mother would say you must pray to the good santa claus for forgiveness he does not like naughty children and unless you repent he will bring you no more pretty toys but santa claus himself would not have approved this speech he brought toys to the children because they were little and helpless and because he loved them he knew that the best of children were sometimes naughty and that the naughty ones were often good it is the way with children the world over and he would not have changed their natures had he possessed the power to do so and that is how our claus became santa claus it is possible for any man by good deeds to enshrine himself as a saint in the hearts of the people ten christmas eve the day that broke as claus returned from his night ride with glossy and flossy brought to him a new trouble will nook the chief guardian of the deer came to him surly and ill-tempered to complain that he had kept glossy and flossy beyond daybreak in opposition to his orders yet it could not have been very long after daybreak said claus it was one minute after answered will nook and that is as bad as one hour i shall set the stinging gnats on glossy and flossy and they will thus suffer terribly for their disobedience don't do that begged claus it was my fault but will nook would listen to no excuses and went away grumbling and growling in his ill-natured way for this reason claus entered the forest to consult nasil about rescuing the good deer from punishment to his delight he found his old friend the master woodsman seated in the circle of nymphs ak listened to the story of the night journey to the children and of the great assistance the deer had been to claus by drawing his sledge over the frozen snow i do not wish my friends to be punished if i can save them said the toy maker when he had finished the relation they were only one minute late and they ran swifter than a bird flies to get home before daybreak ak stroked his beard thoughtfully a moment and then sent for the prince of nooks who rules all his people in bursey and also for the queen of the fairies and the prince of the rills when all had assembled claus told his story again at ak's command and then the master addressed the prince of the nooks saying the good work that claus is doing among mankind deserves the support of every honest and mortal already he is called a saint in some of the towns and before long the name of santa claus will be lovingly known in every home that is blessed with children moreover he is a son of our forest so we owe him our encouragement you ruler of the nooks have known him these many years am i not right in saying he deserves our friendship the prince crooked and sour of visage as all nooks are looked only upon the dead leaves at his feet and muttered you are the master woodsman of the world ox smiled but continued in soft tones it seems that the deer which are guarded by your people can be of great assistance to claus and as they seem willing to draw his sled i beg that you will permit him to use their services whenever he pleases the prince did not reply but tapped the curled point of his sandals with the tip of his spear as if in thought then the fairy queen spoke to him in this way if you consent to ak's request i will see that no harm comes to your deer while they are away from the forest and the prince of the rills added for my part i will allow to every deer that assists claus the privilege of eating my casa plants which gives strength and my grawler plants which give fleetness of foot and my marbon plants which give long life and the queen of the nymphs said the deer which draw the sledge of claus will be permitted to bathe in the forest pool of nares 
which will give them sleek coats and unlimited beauty the prince of the nooks hearing these promises shifted uneasily on his seat for in his heart he hated to refuse a request of his fellow immortals although they were asking an unusual favor at his hands and the nooks are unaccustomed to granting favors of any kind finally he turned to his servants and said call will nook when surly will came and heard the demands of the immortals he protested loudly against granting them dear are dear said he and nothing but dear were they horses it would be right to harness them like horses but no one harnesses deer because they are free wild creatures owing no service of any sort to mankind it would degrade my deer to labour for claus who is only a man in spite of the friendship lavished on him by the immortals you have heard said the prince to ock there is truth in what will says call glossy and flossy returned the master the deer were brought to the conference and ock asked them if they objected to drawing the sledge for claus no indeed replied glossy we enjoyed the trip very much and we tried to get home by daybreak added flossy but were unfortunately a minute too late a minute lost at daybreak doesn't matter said ock you're forgiven for that delay provided that it doesn't happen again said the prince of the nooks sternly and will you permit them to make another journey with me asked claus eagerly the prince reflected while he gazed at will who was scowling and at the master woodsman who was smiling then he stood up and addressed the company as follows since you all urge me to grant the favor i will permit the deer to go with claus once every year on christmas eve provided they always return to the forest by daybreak he may select any number he pleases up to ten to draw his sledge and these shall be known among us as reindeer to distinguish them from others and they shall bathe in the pool of the nares and eat casa and grawl and marbon plants and shall be under special protection of the fairy queen and now cease scowling will nook for my words shall be obeyed he hobbled quickly away through the trees to avoid the thanks of claus and the approval of the other immortals and will looking as cross as ever followed him but ock was satisfied knowing that he could rely on the promise of the prince however grudgingly given and glossy and flossy ran home kicking up their heels delightedly at every step when is christmas eve claus asked the master in about ten days he replied then i cannot use the deer this year said claus thoughtfully for i shall not have time enough to make my sack full of toys the shrewd prince foresaw that responded ock and therefore named christmas eve as the day you might use the deer knowing it would cause you to lose an entire year if i only had the toys the aguas stole from me said claus sadly i could easily fill my sack for the children where are they asked the master i do not know replied claus but the wicked aguas probably hid them in the mountains ock turned to the fairy queen can you find them he asked i will try she replied brightly then claus went back to the laughing valley to work as hard as he could and a band of fairies immediately flew to the mountain that had been haunted by the aguas and began a search for the stolen toys the fairies as we well know possess wonderful powers but the cunning aguas had hidden the toys in a deep cave and covered the opening with rocks so no one could look in therefore all search for the missing playthings proved in vain for several days and claus who sat at home waiting for news from the fairies almost despaired of getting the toys before christmas eve he worked hard every moment but it took considerable time to carve out and to shape each toy and to paint it properly so that on the morning before christmas eve only half of one small shelf above the window was filled with playthings ready for the children but on this morning the fairies who were searching in the mountains had a new thought they joined hands and moved in a straight line through the rocks that formed the mountain 
beginning at the topmost peak and working downward so that no spot could be missed by their bright eyes and at last they discovered the cave where the toys had been heaped up by the wicked aguas it did not take them long to burst open the mouth of the cave and then each one seized as many toys as he could carry and they all flew to claws and laid the treasure before him the good man was rejoiced to receive just in the nick of time such a store of playthings with which to load his sledge and he sent word to glossy and flossy to be ready for the journey at nightfall with all his other labors he had managed to find time since the last trip to repair the harness and to strengthen his sledge so that when the deer came to him at twilight he had no difficulty in harnessing them we must go in another direction tonight he told them where we shall find children i have never yet visited and we must travel fast and work quickly for my sack is full of toys and running over the brim so just as the moon arose they dashed out of the laughing valley and across the plain and over the hills to the south the air was sharp and frosty and the starlight touched the snowflakes and made them glitter like countless diamonds the reindeer leaped onward with strong steady bounds and claus's heart was so light and merry that he laughed and sang while the wind whistled past his ears with a ho 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 and a ha 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 and ho 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 ha ha he now away we go the frozen snow as merry as we can be jack frost heard him and came racing up with his nippers but when he saw it was claus he laughed and turned away again the mother owls heard him as he passed near a wood and stuck their heads out of the hollow places in the tree trunks but when they saw who it was they whispered to the owlets nestling near them that it was only santa claus carrying toys to the children it is strange how much those mother owls know claus stopped at some of the scattered farmhouses and climbed down the chimneys to leave presents for the babies soon after he reached a village and worked merrily for an hour distributing playthings among the sleeping little ones then away he went singing his joyous carol now away we go o'er the gleaming snow while the deer run swift and free for to girls and boys we carry the toys that will fill their hearts with glee the deer liked the sound of his deep bass voice and kept time to the song with their hoofbeats on the hard snow but soon they stopped at another chimney and santa claus with sparkling eyes and face brushed red by the wind climbed down its smoky sides and left a present for every child the house contained it was a merry happy night swiftly the deer ran and busily their driver worked to scatter his gifts among the sleeping children but the sack was empty at last and the sledge headed homeward and now again the race with daybreak began glossy and flossy had no mind to be rebuked a second time for tardiness so they fled with a swiftness that enabled them to pass the gale on which the frost king rode and soon brought them to the laughing valley it is true when claus released his steeds from their harnesses the eastern sky was streaked with gray but glossy and flossy were deep in the forest before day fairly broke claus was so wearied with his night's work that he threw himself upon his bed and fell into a deep slumber and while he slept the christmas sun appeared in the sky and shone upon hundreds of happy homes where the sound of childish laughter proclaimed that santa claus had made them a visit god bless him it was his first christmas eve and for hundreds of years since then he has nobly fulfilled his mission to bring happiness to the hearts of little children eleven how the first stockings were hung by the chimneys when you remember that no child until santa claus began his travels had ever known the pleasure of possessing a toy you will understand how joy crept into the homes of those who had been favored with a visit from the good man and how they talked of him day by day in loving tones and were honestly grateful for his kindly deeds it is true that great warriors and mighty kings and clever scholars of that day were often spoken of by the people but no one of them was so greatly beloved as santa claus because none other was so unselfish as to devote himself to making others happy for a generous deed lives longer than a great battle or a king's decree of a scholar's essay because it spreads and leaves its mark on all nature and endures through many generations the bargain made with the nook prince changed the plans of claus for all future time for being able to use the reindeer on but one night of each year he decided to devote all the other days to the manufacture of playthings and on christmas eve to carry them to the children of the world but a year's work would he knew result in a vast accumulation of toys 
so he resolved to build a new sledge that would be larger and stronger and better fitted for swift travel than the old and clumsy one his first act was to visit the gnome king with whom he made a bargain to exchange three drums a trumpet and two dolls for a pair of fine steel runners curled beautifully at the ends for the gnome king had children of his own who living in the hollows under the earth in mines and caverns needed something to amuse them in three days the steel runners were ready and when claus brought the playthings to the gnome king his majesty was so greatly pleased with them that he presented claus with a string of sweet-toned sleigh bells in addition to the runners these will please glossy and flossy said claus as he jingled the bells and listened to their merry sound but i should have two strings of bells one for each deer bring me another trumpet and a toy cat replied the king and you shall have a second string of bells like the first it's a bargain cried claus and he went home again for the toys the new sledge was carefully built the nooks bringing plenty of strong but thin boards to use in its construction claus made a high rounding dashboard to keep off the snow cast behind by the fleet hoofs of the deer and he made high sides to the platform so that many toys could be carried and finally he mounted the sledge upon the slender steel runners made by the gnome king it was certainly a handsome sledge and big and roomy claus painted it in bright colors although no one was likely to see it during his midnight journeys and when all was finished he sent for flossy and glossy to come and look at it the deer admired the sledge but gravely declared it was too big and heavy for them to draw we might pull it over the snow to be sure said glossy but we will not pull it fast enough to enable us to visit the faraway cities and villages and return to the forest by daybreak then i must add two more deer to my team declared claus after a moment's thought the nook prince allowed you as many as ten why not use them all asked flossie then we could speed like the lightning and leap to the highest roofs with ease a team of ten reindeer cried claus delightedly that will be splendid please return to the forest at once and select eight other deer as like yourselves as possible and you must all eat of the casa plant to become strong and of the grawl plant to become fleet of foot and of the marbon plant that you may live long to accompany me on my journeys likewise it will be well for you to bathe in the pool of nares which the lovely queen zerlin declares will render you rarely beautiful should you perform these duties faithfully there is no doubt that on next christmas eve my ten reindeer will be the most powerful and beautiful steeds the world has ever seen so glossy and flossy went to the forest to choose their mates and claus began to consider the question of a harness for them all in the end he called upon peter nook for assistance for peter's heart is as kind as his body is crooked and he is remarkably shrewd as well and peter agreed to furnish strips of tough leather for the harness this leather was cut from the skins of lions that had reached such an advanced age that they died naturally and on one side was tawny hair while the other side was cured to the softness of velvet by the deft nooks when claus received these strips of leather he sewed them neatly into a harness for the ten reindeer and it proved strong and serviceable and lasted him for many years the harness and sledge were prepared at odd times for claus devoted most of his days to the making of toys these were now much better than the first ones had been for the immortals often came to his house to watch him work and to offer suggestions it was Nasil's idea to make some of the dolls say papa and mama it was a thought of the nooks to put a squeak inside the lambs so that when a child squeezed them they would say ba and the fairy queen advised claus to put whistles in the birds so they could be made to sing and wheels on the horses so children could draw them around many animals perished in the forest from one cause or another and their fur was brought to claus that he might cover with it the small images of beasts he made for playthings a merry rill suggested that claus make a donkey with a nodding head which he did and afterward found that it amused the little ones immensely and so the toys grew in beauty and attractiveness every day until they were the wonder of even the immortals 
when another christmas eve drew near there was a monster load of beautiful gifts for the children ready to be loaded upon the big sledge claus filled three sacks to the brim and tucked every corner of the sledge box full of toys besides then at twilight the ten reindeer appeared and flossie introduced them all to claus they were racer and pacer reckless and speckless fearless and peerless and ready and steady who with glossy and flossy made up the ten who have traversed the world these hundreds of years with their generous master they were all exceedingly beautiful with slender limbs spreading antlers velvety dark eyes and smooth coats of fawn color spotted with white claus loved them at once and has loved them ever since for they are loyal friends and have rendered him priceless service the new harness fitted them nicely and soon they were all fastened to the sledge by twos with glossy and flossy in the lead these were the strings of sleigh bells and were so delighted with the music they made that they kept prancing up and down to make the bells ring claus now seated himself in the sledge drew a warm robe over his knees and his fur cap over his ears and cracked his long whip as a signal to start instantly the ten leaped forward and were away like the wind while jolly claus laughed gleefully to see them run and shouted a song in his big hearty voice with a ho 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 and a ha 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 and ho ho ha ha he now away we go o'er the frozen snow as merry as we can be there are many joys in our load of toys as many a child will know we'll scatter them wide on our wild night ride o'er the crisp and sparkling snow now it was on this same christmas eve that little margot and her brother dick and her cousins ned and sarah who were visiting at margot's house came in from making a snowman with their clothes damp their mittens dripping and their shoes and stockings wet through and through they were not scolded for margot's mother knew that the snow was melting but they were sent early to bed that their clothes might be hung over chairs to dry the shoes were placed on the red tiles of the hearth where the heat from the hot embers would strike them and the stockings were carefully hung in a row by the chimney directly over the fireplace that was the reason santa claus noticed them when he came down the chimney that night and all the household were fast asleep he was in a tremendous hurry and seeing the stockings all belonged to children he quickly stuffed his toys into them and dashed up the chimney again appearing on the roof so suddenly that the reindeer were astonished at his agility i wish they would all hang up their stockings he thought as he drove to the next chimney it would save me a lot of time and i could visit more children before daybreak when margot and dick and ned and sarah jumped out of bed next morning and ran downstairs to get their stockings from the fireplace they were filled with delight to find the toys from santa claus inside them in fact i think they found more presents in their stockings than any other children of that city had received for santa claus was in a hurry and did not stop to count the toys of course they told all their little friends about it and of course every one of them decided to hang his own stockings by the fireplace the next christmas eve even bessie blithesome who made a visit to that city with her father the great lord of lurd heard the story from the children and hung her own pretty stockings by the chimney when she returned home at christmas time on his next trip santa claus found so many stockings hung up in anticipation of his visit that he could fill them in a jiffy and be away again in half the time required to hunt the children up and place the toys beside their bedsides the custom grew year after year and has always been a great help to santa claus and with so many children to visit he surely needs all the help we are able to give him twelve the first christmas tree claus had always kept his promise to the nooks by returning to the laughing valley by daybreak but only the swiftness of his reindeer has enabled him to do this for he travels over all the world he loved his work and he loved the brisk night ride on his sledge and the gay tinkle of the sleigh bells on that first trip with the ten reindeer only glossy and flossy wore bells but each year thereafter for eight years claus carried presents to the children of the gnome king and that good-natured monarch gave him in return a string of bells at each visit so that finally every one of the ten deer was supplied and you may imagine what a merry tune the bells played as the sledge sped over the snow the children's stockings were so long that it required a great many toys to fill them and soon claus found there were other things besides toys that children love 
so he sent some of the fairies who were always his good friends into the tropics and from whence they returned with great bags full of oranges and bananas which they had plucked from the trees and other fairies flew to the wonderful valley of Funnyland, where delicious candies and bonbons grew thickly on the bushes and returned laden with many boxes of sweetmeats for the little ones these things santa claus on each christmas eve placed in the long stockings together with his toys and the children were glad to get them you may be sure there are also warm countries where there is no snow in the winter but claus and his reindeer visited them as well as the colder climes for there were little wheels inside the runners of his sledge which permitted it to run as smoothly over bare ground as on the snow and the children who lived in the warm countries learned to know the name of santa claus as well as those who lived nearer to the laughing valley once just as the reindeer were ready to start on their yearly trip a fairy came to claus and told him of three little children who lived beneath a rude tent of skins on a broad plain where there were no trees whatever these poor babies were miserable and unhappy for their parents were ignorant people who neglected them sadly claus resolved to visit these children before he returned home and during his ride he picked up the bushy top of a pine tree which the wind had broken off and placed it in his sledge it was nearly morning when the deer stopped before the lonely tent of skins where the poor children lay asleep claus at once planted the bit of pine tree in the sand and stuck many candles on the branches then he hung some of his prettiest toys on the tree as well as several bags of candies it did not take long to do all this for santa claus works quickly and when all was ready he lighted the candles and thrusting his head in at the opening of the tent he shouted merry christmas little ones with that he leaped into his sledge and was out of sight before the children rubbing the sleep from their eyes could come out to see who had called them you can imagine the wonder and joy of those little ones who had never in their lives known a real pleasure before when they saw the tree sparkling with lights that shone brilliant in the gray dawn and hung with toys enough to make them happy for years to come they joined hands and danced around the tree shouting and laughing until they were obliged to pause for breath and their parents also came out to look and wonder and thereafter had more respect and consideration for their children since santa claus had honored them with such beautiful gifts the idea of the christmas tree pleased claus and so the following year he carried many of them in his sledge and set them up in the homes of poor people who seldom saw trees and placed candles and toys on the branches of course he could not carry enough trees in one load of all who wanted them but in some homes the fathers were able to get trees and have them all ready for santa claus when he arrived and these the good claus always decorated as prettily as possible and hung with toys enough for all the children who came to see the tree lighted these novel ideas and the generous manner in which they were carried out made the children long for that one night in the year when their friend santa claus should visit them and as such anticipation is very pleasant and comforting the little ones gleaned much happiness by wondering what would happen when santa claus next arrived perhaps you remember that stern baron braun who once drove claus from his castle and forbade him to visit his children well many years afterward when the old baron was dead and his son ruled in his place the new baron braun came to the house of claus with his train of knights and pages and henchmen and dismounting from his charger bared his head humbly before the friend of children my father did not know your goodness and worth he said and therefore threatened to hang you from the castle walls but i have children of my own who long for a visit from santa claus and i have come to beg that you will favor them hereafter as you do other children claus was pleased with this speech for castle braun was the only place he had never visited and he gladly promised to bring presents to the baron's children the next christmas eve the baron went away contented and claus kept his promise faithfully thus did this man through very goodness conquer the hearts of all and it is no wonder he was ever merry and gay for there was no home in the wide world where he was not welcomed more royally than any king End of section 4「The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Section 5. Old Age. 1. The Mantle of Immortality. And now we come to a turning point in the career of Santa Claus, and it is my duty to relate the most remarkable that has happened since the world began or mankind was created. We have followed the life of Claus from the time he was found a helpless infant by the wood nymph Nacelle, and reared to manhood in the great forest of Burzee. And we know how he began to make toys for children, and how, with the assistance and good will of the immortals, he was able to distribute them to the little ones throughout the world. For many years he carried on this noble work, for the simple, hard-working life he led gave him perfect health and strength. And doubtless a man can live longer in the beautiful Laughing Valley, where there are no cares and everything is peaceful and merry, than in any other part of the world. But when many years had rolled away, Santa Claus grew old. The long beard of golden brown that once covered his cheeks and chin gradually became gray, and finally turned to pure white. His hair was white, too, and there were wrinkles at the corners of his eyes, which showed plainly when he laughed. He had never been a very tall man, and now he became fat and waddled very much like a duck when he walked. But in spite of these things he remained as lively as ever, and was just as jolly and gay, and his kind eyes sparkled as brightly as they did that first day when he came to the Laughing Valley. Yet a time is sure to come when every mortal who has grown old and lived his life is required to leave this world for another, so it is no wonder that after Santa Claus had driven his reindeer on many and many a Christmas Eve, those staunch friends finally whispered among themselves that they had probably drawn his sledge for the last time. Then all the forest of Burzee became sad, and all the Laughing Valley was hushed. For every living thing that had known Claus had used to love him and to brighten at the sound of his footsteps or the notes of his merry whistle. No doubt the old man's strength was at last exhausted, for he made no more toys, but lay on his bed as in a dream. The nymph, Nacelle, she who had reared him and been his foster mother, was still youthful and strong and beautiful, and it seemed to her but a short time since this aged, grey-bearded man had lain in her arms and smiled on her with his innocent baby lips. In this is shown the difference between mortals and immortals. It was fortunate that the great Ock came to the forest at this time. Nacelle saw Tim with troubled eyes and told him of the fate that threatened their friend Claus. At once the master became grave, and he leaned upon his axe and stroked his grizzled beard thoughtfully for many minutes. Then suddenly he stood up straight, and poised his powerful head with firm resolve, and stretched out his great right arm as if determined on doing some mighty deed. For a thought had come to him so grand in its conception that all the world might well bow before the master woodsman and honor his name for ever. It is well known that when the great Ock once undertakes to do a thing, he never hesitates an instant. Now he summoned his fleetest messengers, and sent them in a flash to many parts of the earth. And when they were gone, he turned to the anxious Nacelle and comforted her, saying, Be of good heart, my child. Our friend still lives. And now run to your queen and tell her that I have summoned a council of all the immortals of the world to meet with me here in Burzee this night. If they obey and hearken unto my words, Claus will drive his reindeer for countless ages yet to come. At midnight there was a wondrous scene in the ancient forest of Burzee, where for the first time in many centuries the rulers of the immortals who inhabit the earth were gathered together. There was the queen of the water sprites, whose beautiful form was as clear as crystal but continually dripped water on the bank of moss where she sat and beside her was the king of the sleep fays who carried a wand from the end of which a fine dust fell all around so that no mortal could keep awake long enough to see him as mortal eyes were sure to close in sleep as soon as the dust filled them and next to him sat the known king whose people inhabit all that region under the earth's surface, where they guard the precious metals and the jewel stones that lie buried in rock and ore. At his right hand stood the king of the sound imps, who had wings on his feet, for his people are swift to carry all sounds that are made. When they are busy they carry the sounds but short distances, for there are many of them, but sometimes they speed with the sounds to places miles and miles away from where they are made. The king of the sound imps had an anxious and careworn face, 
for most people have no consideration for his imps and especially the boys and girls make a great many unnecessary sounds which the imps are obliged to carry when they might be better employed the next in the circle of the immortals was the king of the wind demons slender of frame restless and uneasy at being confined to one place for even an hour once in a while he would leave his place and circle around the glade and each time he did this the fairy queen was obliged to untangle the flowing locks of her golden hair and tuck them back of her pink ears but she did not complain for it was not often that the king of the wind demons came into the heart of the forest after the fairy queen whose home you know was in old Burzee, came the king of the light elves with his two princes flash and twilight at his back he never went anywhere without his princes for they were so mischievous that he dared not let them wander alone prince flash bore a lightning bolt in his right hand and a horn of gunpowder in his left and his bright eyes roved constantly around as if he longed to use his blinding flashes prince twilight held a great snuffer in one hand and a big black cloak in the other and it is well known that unless twilight is carefully watched the snuffers or the cloak will throw everything into darkness and darkness is the greatest enemy the king of the light elves has in addition to the immortals i have named were the king of the nooks who had come from his home in the jungles of india and the king of the rills who lived among the gay flowers and luscious fruits of valencia sweet queen zerline of the wood nymphs completed the circle of immortals but in the centre of the circle sat three others who possessed powers so great that all the kings and queens showed them reverence these were ak the master woodsman of the world who rules the forests and the orchards and the groves and kern the master husbandman of the world who rules the grain fields and the meadows and the gardens and Bo, the master mariner of the world who rules the seas and all the craft that float thereon and all other immortals are more or less subject to these three when all had assembled the master woodsman of the world stood up to address them since he himself had summoned them to the council very clearly he told them the story of claus beginning at the time when as a babe he had been adopted a child of the forest and telling of his noble and generous nature and his life-long labors to make children happy and now said ak when he had won the love of all the world the spirit of death is hovering over him of all men who have inhabited the earth none other so well deserves immortality for such a life cannot be spared so long as there are children of mankind to miss him and to grieve over his loss we immortals are the servants of the world and to serve the world we were permitted in the beginning to exist but what one of us is more worthy of immortality than this man claus who so sweetly ministers to the little children he paused and glanced around the circle to find every immortal listening to him eagerly and nodding approval finally the king of the wind demons who had been whistling softly to himself cried out what is your desire o ak to bestow upon claus the mantle of immortality said ak boldly that this demand was wholly unexpected was proved by the immortals springing to their feet and looking into each other's face with dismay and then upon ak with wonder for it was a grave matter this parting with the mantle of immortality the queen of the water sprites spoke in her low clear voice and the words sounded like raindrops splashing upon a window pane in all the world there is but one mantle of immortality she said the king of the sound phase added it has existed since the beginning and no mortal has ever dared to claim it and the master mariner of the world arose and stretched his limbs saying only by the vote of every immortal can it be bestowed upon a mortal i know all this answered ak quietly but the mantle exists and if it was created as you say in the beginning it was because the supreme master knew that some day it would be required until now no mortal has deserved it but who among you dares deny that the good clause deserves it will you not all vote to bestow it upon him they were silent still looking upon one another questioningly of what use is the mantle of immortality unless it is worn demanded ak what will it profit any of us to allow it to remain in its lonely shrine for all time to come enough cried the gnome king abruptly we will vote on the matter yes or no 
for my part i say yes and i said the fairy queen promptly and ock rewarded her with a smile my people in Burzee tell me they have learned to love him therefore i vote to give claus the mantle said the king of the rills he is already a comrade of the nooks announced the ancient king of that band let him have immortality let him have it let him have it sighed the king of the wind demons why not asked the king of the sleep face he never disturbs the slumbers my people allow humanity let the good claws be immortal i do not object said the king of the sound imps nor i murmured the queen of the water sprites if claws does not receive the mantle it is clear none other can ever claim it remarked the king of the light elves So let us have done with the thing for all time the wood nymphs were first to adopt him said queen zerline of course i shall vote to make him immortal ach now turned to the master husbandman of the world who held up his right arm and said yes and the master mariner of the world did likewise after which ach with sparkling eyes and smiling face cried out i thank you fellow immortals for all have voted yes, and so to our dear claws shall fall the one mantle of immortality that is in our power to bestow. Let us fetch it at once, said the Fay King. I'm in a hurry. They bowed assent, and instantly the forest glade was deserted. But in a place midway between the earth and the sky was suspended a gleaming crypt of gold and platinum, aglow with soft lights shed from the facets of countless gems. Within a high dome hung the precious mantle of immortality, and each immortal placed a hand on the hem of the splendid robe, and said, as with one voice, We bestow this mantle upon Claus, who is called the patron saint of children. At this the mantle came away from its lofty crypt, and they carried it to the house in the Laughing Valley. The spirit of death was crouching very near to the bedside of Claus, and as the immortals approached, she sprang up and motioned them back with an angry gesture. But when her eyes fell upon the mantle they bore, she shrank away with a low moan of disappointment and quitted that house forever. Softly and silently the immortal band dropped upon Claus the precious mantle, and it closed about him and sank into the outlines of his body and disappeared from view. It became a part of his being, and neither mortal nor immortal might ever take it from him. Then the kings and queens who had wrought this deed dispersed to their various homes, and all were well contented that they had added another immortal to their band. And Claus slept on, the red blood of everlasting life coursing swiftly through his veins, and on his brow was a tiny drop of water that had fallen from the ever-melting gown of the queen of the water sprites, and over his lips hovered a tender kiss that had been left by the sweet nymph Nasil for she had stolen in when the others were gone to gaze with rapture upon the immortal form of her foster son. 2. When the World Grew Old The next morning, when Santa Claus opened his eyes and gazed around the familiar room, which he had feared he might never see again, he was astonished to find his old strength renewed, and to feel the red blood of perfect health coursing through his veins. He sprang from his bed and stood where the bright sunshine came in through his window and flooded him with its merry, dancing rays. He did not then understand what had happened to restore to him the vigor of youth, but in spite of the fact that his beard remained the color of snow, and that wrinkles still lingered in the corners of his bright eyes, old Santa Claus felt as brisk and merry as a boy of sixteen, and was soon whistling contentedly as he busied himself fashioning new toys. Then Ock came to him and told of the mantle of immortality, and how Claus had won it through his love for little children. It made old Santa look grave for a moment to think he had been so favored, but it also made him glad to realize that now he need never fear being parted from his dear ones. At once he began preparations for making a remarkable assortment of pretty and amusing playthings, and in larger quantities than ever before, 
for now that he might always devote himself to this work he decided that no child in the world poor or rich should hereafter go without a christmas gift if he could manage to supply it the world was new in the days when dear old santa claus first began toy-making and won by his loving deeds the mantle of immortality and the task of supplying cheering words sympathy and pretty playthings to all the young of his race did not seem a difficult undertaking at all but every year more and more children were born into the world and these when they grew up began spreading slowly over all the face of the earth seeking new homes so that santa claus found each year that his journeys must extend farther and farther from the laughing valley and that the packs of toys must be made larger and ever larger so at length he took counsel with his fellow immortals how his work might keep pace with the increasing number of children that none might be neglected and the immortals were so greatly interested in his labors that they gladly rendered him their assistance ock gave him his man kilter the silent and swift and the nook prince gave him peter who was more crooked and less surly than any of his brothers and the real prince gave him neuter the sweetest tempered rill ever known and the fairy queen gave him whisk that tiny mischievous but lovable fairy who knows to-day almost as many children as does santa claus himself with these people to help make the toys and to keep his house in order and to look after the sledge and the harness santa claus found it much easier to prepare his yearly load of gifts and his days began to follow one another smoothly and pleasantly yet after a few generations his worries were renewed for it was remarkable how the number of people continued to grow and how many more children there were every year to be served when the people filled all the cities and lands of one country they wandered into another part of the world and the men cut down the trees in many of the great forests that had been ruled by ak and with the wood they built new cities and where the forests had been were fields of grain and herds of browsing cattle you might think the master woodsman would rebel at the loss of his forests but not so the wisdom of ak was mighty and far-seeing the world was made for men said he to santa claus i have but guarded the forests until men needed them for their use i am glad my strong trees can furnish shelter for men's weak bodies and warm them through the cold winters but i hope they will not cut down all the trees for mankind needs the shelter of the woods in summer as much as the warmth of blazing logs in winter and however crowded the world may grow i do not think that men will ever come to Brzee, nor to the great black forest nor to the wooded wilderness of baths unless they seek their shades for pleasure and not to destroy their giant trees by and by people made ships from tree trunks and crossed over oceans and built cities in far lands but the oceans made little difference to the journeys of santa claus his reindeer sped over the waters as swiftly as over land and his sledge headed from east to west and followed in the wake of the sun so that as the earth rolled slowly over santa claus had all of twenty-four hours to encircle it each christmas eve and the speedy reindeer enjoyed these wonderful journeys more and more so year after year and generation after generation and century after century the world grew older and the people became more numerous and the labors of santa claus steadily increased the fame of his good deeds spread to every household where children dwelt and all the little ones loved him dearly and the fathers and mothers honored him for the happiness he had given them when they too were young and the aged grandsires and grand dames remembered him with tender gratitude and blessed his name three the deputies of santa claus however there was one evil following in the path of civilization that caused santa claus a vast amount of trouble before he discovered a way to overcome it but fortunately it was the last trial he was forced to undergo one christmas eve when his reindeer had leaped to the top of a new building santa claus was surprised to find that the chimney had been built much smaller than usual but he had no time to think about it just then so he drew in his breath and made himself as small as possible and slid down the chimney i ought to be at the bottom by this time he thought as he continued to slip downward but no fireplace of any sort met his view and by and by he reached the very end of the chimney which was in the cellar this is odd he reflected much puzzled by this experience if there is no fireplace what on earth is the chimney good for then he began to climb out again and found it hard work the space being so small and on his way up he noticed a thin round pipe sticking through the side of the chimney but could not guess what it was for 
finally he reached the roof and said to the reindeer there was no need of my going down that chimney for i could find no fireplace through which to enter the house i fear the children who live there must go without playthings this christmas then he drove on but soon came to another new house with a small chimney this caused santa claus to shake his head doubtfully but he tried the chimney nevertheless and found it exactly like the other moreover he nearly stuck fast in the narrow flue and tore his jacket trying to get out again so although he came to several such chimneys that night he did not venture to descend any more of them what in the world are people thinking of to build such useless chimneys he exclaimed in all the years i have travelled with my reindeer i have never seen the like before true enough but santa claus had not then discovered that stoves had been invented and were fast coming into use when he did find it out he wondered how the builders of those houses could have so little consideration for him when they knew very well it was his custom to climb down chimneys and enter houses by way of the fireplaces perhaps the men who built those houses had outgrown their own love for toys and were indifferent whether santa claus called on their children or not whatever the explanation might be the poor children were forced to bear the burden of grief and disappointment the following year santa claus found more and more of the new-fashioned chimneys that had no fireplaces and the next year still more the third year so numerous had the narrow chimneys become he even had a few toys left in his sledge that he was unable to give away because he could not get to the children the matter had now become so serious that it worried the good man greatly and he decided to talk it over with kilter and peter and neuter and whisk kilter already knew something about it for it had been his duty to run around to all the houses just before christmas and gather up the notes and letters to santa claus that the children had written telling what they wished put in their stockings or hung on their christmas trees but kilter was a silent fellow and seldom spoke of what he saw in the cities and villages the others were very indignant those people act as if they do not wish their children to be made happy said sensible peter in a vexed tone the idea of shutting out such a generous friend to their little ones but it is my intention to make children happy whether their parents wish it or not returned santa claus years ago when i first began making toys children were even more neglected by their parents than they are now so i have learned to pay no attention to thoughtless or selfish parents but to consider only the longings of childhood you are right my master said neuter the rill many children would lack a friend if you did not consider them and try to make them happy Then declared the laughing whisk we must abandon any thought of using these new-fashioned chimneys but become burglars and break into the houses some other way what way asked santa claus why walls of brick and wood and plaster are nothing to fairies i can easily pass through them whenever i wish and so can peter and neuter and kilter is it not so comrades i often pass through the walls when i gather up the letters said kilter and that was a long speech for him and so surprised peter and neuter that their big round eyes nearly popped out of their heads therefore continued the fairy you may as well take us with you on your next journey and when we come to one of those houses with stoves instead of fireplaces we will distribute the toys to the children without the need of using a chimney that seems to me a good plan replied santa claus well pleased at having solved the problem we will try it next year that was how the fairy the pixie the nook and the rill all rode in the sledge with their master that following christmas eve and they had no trouble at all in entering the new-fashioned houses and leaving toys for the children that lived in them and their deft services not only relieved santa claus of much labor but enabled him to complete his own work more quickly than usual so that the merry party found themselves at home with an empty sledge a full hour before daybreak the only drawback to the journey was that the mischievous whisk persisted in tickling the reindeer with a long feather to see them jump and santa claus found it necessary to watch him every minute and to tweak his long ears once or twice to make him behave himself but taken all together the trip was a great success and to this day the four little folk always accompany santa claus on his yearly ride and help him in the distribution of his gifts but the indifference of parents which had so annoyed the good saint did not continue very long 
and Santa Claus soon found they were really anxious he should visit their homes on Christmas Eve and leave presents for their children. So, to lighten his task, which was fast becoming very difficult indeed, old Santa decided to ask the parents to assist him. Get your Christmas trees all ready for my coming, he said to them, and then I shall be able to leave the presents without loss of time, and you can put them on the trees when I am gone. And to others he said, See that the children's stockings are hung up in readiness for my coming, and then I can fill them as quick as a wink. And often, when parents were kind and good-natured, Santa Claus would simply fling down his package of gifts and leave the fathers and mothers to fill the stockings after he had darted away in his sledge. I will make all loving parents my deputies, cried the jolly old fellow, and they shall help me do my work. For in this way I shall have many precious minutes, and few children need to be neglected for lack of time to visit them. Besides carrying around the big packs in his swift flying sledge, old Santa began to send great heaps of toys to the toy shops, so that if parents wanted larger supplies for their children they could easily get them, and if any children were, by chance, missed by Santa Claus on his yearly rounds, they could go to the toy shops and get enough to make them happy and contented. For the loving friend of the little ones decided that no child, if he could help it, should long for toys in vain. And the toy shops also proved convenient whenever a child fell ill and needed a new toy to amuse it, and sometimes on birthdays the fathers and mothers go to the toy shops and get pretty gifts for their children in honor of the happy event. Perhaps you will now understand how, in spite of the bigness of the world, Santa Claus is able to supply all the children with beautiful gifts. To be sure, the old gentleman is rarely seen in these days, but it is not because he tries to keep out of sight, I assure you. Santa Claus is the same loving friend of children that in the old days used to play and romp with them by the hour. And I know he would love to do the same now, if he had the time. But you see, he is so busy all the year making toys, and so hurried on that one night when he visits our homes with his packs, that he comes and goes among us like a flash and it is almost impossible to catch a glimpse of him. And although there are millions and millions more children in the world than there used to be, Santa Claus has never been known to complain of their increasing numbers. The more the merrier, he cries with his jolly laugh, and the only difference to him is the fact that his little workmen have to make their busy fingers fly faster every year to satisfy the demands of so many little ones. In all this world there is nothing so beautiful as a happy child says good old santa claus and if he had his way the children would all be beautiful for all would be happy end of section five end of the life and adventures of santa claus by l frank baum